It is a pleasure today to welcome you all at London Business School Willard Institute for Business and Development event. Today we will be discussing alongside Shebnam Kalemlios Khan and Kamal Nuramdas about health inequality implications for developing and developed countries. This is going to be the fourth event uh, of the London Business School Willard Institute of Development that we organized in this year. Earlier in the year, we hosted Esther Duplo and Abhijit Banerjee, and we discussed about the implications of COVID and the pandemic in Africa in low-income countries and emerging markets. Then, alongside Nick Hughes and Leonard Vancek, we delved into issues related to Africa. We had an optimistic agenda, but all dependent on how Africa would cope with the pandemic. Today, we are digging more in those explorations, and we will look on vaccination. And we couldn't be more happy and privileged to have with, the, with us two global experts, uh, and we will discuss two interrelated issues related to vaccination. Our first uh, guest today is Shevnem Kalinoyos Khan. Uh, Shevnem is the Neil Moskovich Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Maryland at College Park. Shevnem in the past has worked at the University of Houston after obtaining, where she worked for many years after obtaining her PhD for Brown. She has held visiting positions at the European Central Bank where we first met and also at the International Monetary Fund. Shevnem also serves as editor and associate editor at the American Economic Review and the Journal of International Economics. And most importantly for our discussion today, Shevnem has been engaged in the past year in very fascinating topical and policy relevant research that tries to assess the role of vaccinations, uh, for example, as we will discuss today, of low income countries on rich uh, countries. An issue that sadly was not much uh, looked by the G7, the European Union, and the US up until recently. We will be joined with our own uh, Kamalini Ramdas, uh, my great colleague from the Operations uh, Research and Management Area. Uh, Kamalini serves as professor uh, at the London Business School. Uh, she also worked in the States after obtaining her PhD from the Wharton School. Most importantly, Kamalini, who is taking a very practical and hands-on approach uh, on vaccination and more generally on health. Uh, she has worked on various health-related aspects from an operations research, which is sadly overlooked, at least in our profession, economics. And both Kamalini and Shevren have been working also with researchers or with policymakers in the World Health Organization and other international institutions on very topical issues. So Shevren and Kamalini, I know that you are very busy. Thanks a lot for taking the time and being with us uh, today. Some rules, uh, you can use the chat or post questions. Uh, we have budgeted a lot of time for questions and, uh, uh, from the floor. So uh, I will collect the questions and I will post them uh, after half an hour, roughly speaking, with uh, Shevlin and Kamalini. This webinar will last for one hour. So, uh, Shevnam, I want to start our discussion with you uh, because I think a couple of weeks ago you released uh, a, an academic paper uh, that received a lot of attention. This is not something uh, that happens typically in economics that explores the implications for rich countries and the world economy more generally, but let's say for countries such as the European Union, Japan, uh, the US, Canada of not vaccinating or partly or partially vaccinating uh, low income countries. And we know uh, that there is considerable inequity in the distribution of vaccines. And uh, many people in the UK, in Greece, where I'm currently located, in the US where we live, complain about slow vaccination, a uh, process about mistakes perhaps of the administration, but we tend to forget that many countries do not have any access or very limited access to vaccines. So I would kindly ask you to give us an overview of your very fascinating research. Thank you. You can share your screen, your slides, if you have any that you can use. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Elias, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. And indeed, uh, let me uh, share uh, my slides so that I can show you a couple of pictures. Uh, this, this paper, as you just mentioned, uh, that we did on the economic case for global vaccination, is joint work with my colleagues at Koç University in Turkey, uh, Jan Çakmaklı, Selva Demir Alp, Selcan Yeşiltaş, and Mohamed Yıldırım. And we, we, we also started exactly from this, this, this type of uh, thinking, like, as you said, Elias, like, like, look, I mean, you know, we are 
uh, in nitty gritty of these things in advanced economies, but emerging markets and developed economies, they don't even have the vaccine. So how should we think about such a world, such a world with inequitable uh, vaccine distribution? And basically, you know, we would like to start from the point that, uh, you know, we know that there has been huge loss of life and livelihoods due to COVID. And now vaccines put us in this uplifting mood that, uh, you know, end this site, we are going to stop this pandemic. But of course, the thinking is very country specific, right? We just vaccinate our citizens and we are going to stop pandemic in our country. We want to make the point in this work that we do live in a global world. Uh, you know, world is connected to many linkages and given these interconnections, global interconnection between countries, even you vaccinate everyone in a given country, say US, you are still going to suffer economic cost because of these linkages. And specifically in the paper, we focus uh, on these costs. We put numbers on these, on these uh, costs and we ask three questions. What is the economic impact of not vaccinating poorer nations on richer nations? How much global cost rich nations are going to bear even they achieve universal inoculation in their own populations? And then which sectors, rich economies are especially vulnerable. So that's going to get into the granularity of the data and to show you, uh, to you know, prove you that it is really, even you eliminate the pandemic as a rich country in your country, you will still have several sectors very vulnerable due to these global linkages and that will increase your economic cost. And, and we really want to pu push the debate to this economic side because uh, I you know, presented the paper first time in a press conference with Dr. Tedros, WHO press conference on January 26 with Dr. Tedros. And he also started uh, the conference like that. He said like, look, there is the moral side, the ethical side of sharing the vaccines, but there's also this economic side. It is in the best interest of advanced economies to make sure there's an equitable uh, global vaccine distribution. And, and, and then he introduced me to present the economic case. And let me tell you how the economic case works and how we come up with these numbers. So. We, we want to match the sectoral heterogeneity in the epidemic to sectoral heterogeneity in the production. So we already know now that services sectors are hit much harder than the manufacturing sectors, right? This is the story of closed restaurants, closed gyms and movie theaters and all that. So we think a model that is sectoral that can match that sectoral heterogeneity in the epidemic to sectoral heterogeneity to the fact that, you know, US construction sector buys still you know, from uh, China and glass from Brazil and that type of linkages at a global level. So if you think our model in a picture, it will be for any given sector, there will be COVID and the top part of this figure tell you the demand story because people are sick, people are going to demand less and that's the closed restaurant story, but also foreign demand for that sector's output going to go down. That's the tourism story, if you will, which is something that is going to, that affected countries like Greece and Turkey a lot. So that gives you the demand side determination of output. So this was actually done in our previous paper from May, 2020. And the bottom part of this figure gives you the supply side story because COVID is both a demand shock and a supply shock at the sector level. That tells you, look, you have to take the epidemiology into account to understand what is going on in that sector. You have workers, some of them can telework like you and I, we are doing right now. So we might have a lower infection rate, but some workers are going to be on site and depending on how close they work with others, like doctors versus, you know, um, uh, agriculture workers, depending on that proximity, physical proximity, as we call it, you are going to have a higher infection rate. That gives you a sector label supply shock, and that is going to be combined with domestic and foreign intermediate inputs you buy, as in the example of U.S. construction sector buying a lot of inputs, although itself is an untradable sector. That gives you the supply side story, and these two is going to give you the output in that sector. Now, I just showed you one sector, so you have to think this in a world stage, right? In a global stage, that one sector uh, is going to be linked to many sectors. So if you look at these red, pink, orange network figure on the right here, that's going to be all the linkages between sectors. For example, construction sector here, that might be buying less input from outside. That's why it is light pink, as opposed to this coke and petroleum product sector, which is dark pink, almost red, okay? But the point is these sectors are all linked to each other. So it doesn't matter if you buy directly your inputs or you sell directly your output to other country sectors, but how you are connected to other sectors in the economy. And now think the sector linkages embedded fully on the left-hand side figure, which is the blue figure. That is the linkages between countries. And you see larger countries are going to be shown with bigger boxes here like US. 
and the darker uh, blue is going to be open, more open countries that more trade each other and th that countries that need more inputs to produce from e e one and the other, okay? And that's kind of the color coding and the links are showing the, the extent of the trade between countries, both in terms of intermediate and final goods. And here the boxes around the countries are going to assume they are vaccinated. So we are going to assume all advanced economies are vaccinated sometime in 2021 and the, the poor countries, uh, poor and mid-income, emerging market and developed economies are not going to be vaccinated. We are also going to assume China to be vaccinated as, as shown here. So basically this is the exercise. We use this information of uh, sectoral and country linkages globally to capture the global trade and production network so that we can calculate the cost in the advanced economy like US, even if it achieves universal inoculation, how US can be still hurt economically because of these linkages shown on the slide when other countries are not vaccinated, okay? And again, the, the sectoral heterogeneity in terms of, uh, you know, having uh, being, being able to telework or how close you work to others is going to be very important. For example, here, the first uh, bar here is agriculture and fishing. You see that uh, teleworking, the pink uh, bar is low because you can't do your agriculture and fishing job by emails and the phone. But proximity shown with the gray bar, dark gray is also low because you don't work close with each other. Whereas a sector like health and social work shown at the end here is, has low teleworkability because you can't do much by emails and the phone and high proximity, right? You need others close by to work with. So this is going to be extremely important in terms of sectoral infection heterogeneity and how that is going to be linked to sectoral production. So the question we ask, okay, how much global and local amplification can we get from a health shock affecting demand and supply in a given sector uh, through the input output linkages globally? So we are going to work out two cases. One case where we say no IPN, that means you don't allow this amplification channel through international production and trade networks. And the other case, when we say IPN, you allow amplification through international production and trade network. In both cases, we are going to allow, allow demand to go down with infections. We have a full epidemiological model here. So infections are going to affect consumption preferences directly, both domestic and the foreign side. But in two cases, we will first show you no amplification where you only use your own labor to produce. You don't buy any inputs from other countries. And the other case, we allow that and we can show you how high you can go on these economic costs. So the first case scenario work out the labor supply shock. The second case scenario will allow this full amplification where US car industry as happening now has to stop car production because they cannot buy the chips from Asian countries. And that was actually in the news recently where the car production is now actually completely came to a standstill uh, in US. So the way vaccination enters to this story is by eliminating these shocks. So your demand is normal thanks to the vaccination and your workers are not sick. So your labor supply is back to normal. You don't have the sick workers problem. Let me show you our baseline numbers and then stop. So we work both scenarios, uh, no amplification through international exports and imports and amplification through international export and import basically uh, under three different scenarios. The first two scenarios shown in the first block and the second block here is going to assume immediate full vaccination in advanced economies early in 2021 and no vaccination whatsoever in emerging market and developed economies. The difference between these two scenarios, we are going to also introduce endogenous lockdowns in emerging market and developed economies when infections come to a level so that their ICU capacities are breached, so they have to put lockdowns. And this is actually happening right now as, of, as we speak. And the final scenario, which, which is our baseline, which we think a realistic scenario, there is going to be full vaccination by mid-2021 in advanced economies. And in fact, uh, Biden administration just announced in the US by May 2021, all adults can be vaccinated. And for emerging market and developing economies, there is some vaccination, but not at all, all the way by early 2022, okay? And we will allow also endogenous lockdowns, given that, you know, the cases are going to be very severe in emerging markets and developed economies, they are going to uh, lock down their economy. So when we look at these cases, actually, when you have full amplification through these global uh, production and trade networks that I showed you, the global cost is 4 trillion, but I want to focus on this number in orange here, 49%. 49% of that 4 trillion global cost is going to fall on advanced economies, even they achieve full vaccination by the summer of 2020. Okay, so half of the cost is borne by advanced economies. 
And if somehow there is nothing happening on this global supply chain, the cost goes down to 2 trillion, but still 21.7% of that is paid by advanced economies, countries that achieve full vaccination in their own economies. And these numbers are not small, right? They you know, correspond from one to almost 3% of pre-pandemic GDP of advanced economies. Let me stop here and then uh, maybe I can show you more once you have your question. Thank you, Shemlin. This is truly fascinating. Uh, I have many, many questions and I'm sure that the, our friends who are watching us will have more. So let me uh, postpone uh, the questions I have. Uh, let me turn to Kamalini. Uh, what is important both for economic terms as uh, Sheldon's work shows, but more generally I would say also from an ethical viewpoint, uh, seems to crucially depend on how we can do vaccinations, but not only vaccinations, uh, vaccinations is one part of a bigger health uh, intervention, I guess, agenda. And you know that you have been working a lot, for example, on testing, on uh, group appointments. So I want to start uh, uh, by asking a question, what can be done also on the testing side or other, if you like, uh, health interventions? Thank you, Elias. I want to say, first of all, that uh, Shebnam, it was uh, fascinating to hear, uh, learn about your work. And uh, you are clearly putting, uh, showing the costs of what will happen if we don't have healthcare equity and it is huge, huge cost. And uh, I want to share uh, what I think health equity is, first of all. I feel that health equity is achieved if equal or better quality can be offered at much lower cost. And a lot of my focus is on how can that be done as opposed to you know what you've already shown is how huge the cost is the economic cost if it is not done and um, as elias pointed out i have been uh, doing some work on testing if you think about testing covid testing in particular there is basically a trade off that uh, all countries are facing on the one hand you have tests like the RT-PCR test, which is, um, they are expensive. They are slow in the sense it is a lab test. It requires sample to be delivered to the lab and then the result has, the sample is processed in the lab and they are accurate tests. Or on the other hand, you have these cheap pregnancy test type of test, which is called a lateral flow point of care test. They are quick. They're cheap, but they are inaccurate. So there is this trade-off here. And in terms of the numbers, huge amounts of money are being spent on testing. So in um, about October, the UK uh, government decided that 43 million was going to be, 43 billion was going to be spent on testing, billion. US, Joe Biden has recently announced that revamping of testing, $50 billion are going to be spent. And the question is, is there a way to do the testing in these advanced economies without spending those huge amounts of money? My uh, perspective based on the work I've been doing with multiple researchers is that there is a way to achieve high accuracy at much lower cost. And uh, I'll share with you uh, some of the reasoning behind it and why, in fact, instead of wasting the inaccurate tests, you could do much better by combining. By combining, I mean that for a particular patient in a particular instance, give them two tests. So think about if you had a fair coin and you tossed it you would think that chance of heads is 50%. But what is the chance you get two heads, right? It's 25%. And what is the chance you get three heads goes down. So similarly, if you had a cheap test, which is you know, as good as a coin toss, there's a 50% chance that you get a false signal, like a false negative. But if you repeated the test, or you took two different cheap tests, 
that uh, signal is becoming stronger, there would only be a 25% chance that you get a, a false negative, for instance. And similarly, if you did three, it is becoming even uh, a stronger signal. So this is a very simple mathematical idea. And this idea can have profound implications for how we are doing testing. This uh, simple idea we published, uh, my co-authors on this are Sanjay Jain, who is an economist at uh, Oxford, and um, Lord Ara Dazi. He is a surgeon at Imperial, and um, he was uh, in the Labour government uh, parliamentary undersecretary to health. And I want to share with you how this idea can be used. So if you think about combining tests, one thing is that if you want to combine two tests, then you need some way to combine them, which you can call a classification rule. So consider um, any test. There are two aspects to accuracy. One is sensitivity, which is if you have COVID, what is the chance that the test will pick it up? And in fact, even those cheap tests, uh, which just to give you a sense of the cost, um, uh, an expensive test in the UK is a hundred pounds, in the US is a hundred dollars, even if it's being bought by an institution or a big organization. The cheap tests are one tenth or less the cost. So it could be $10 or pounds, even less than that. But cheap tests are better than a coin toss usually. Let's say you have 60% sensitivity. Specificity is if you don't have COVID, what is the chance that the test will tell you correctly you don't have it? So you've got these two numbers. Now, if you did only one test, it's simple, right? It'll either come out plus or minus. But if you got two tests, there are four outcomes. So then you have to decide which outcome, if you get plus plus, should I call that a plus? What about if I got plus minus? So what kind of logic is usually used is you think about which costs are bigger. For example, if you're worried about false negatives, so for, uh, if you're thinking of an, uh, a doctor sitting in front of an elderly patient who may have diabetes, asthma, some other comorbidities, the false negative is very costly because that patient is probably going to end up in the ICU, potentially ventilator. It could be life and death for them. And so with the two tests, you would say, well, I'll believe any positive. So that is called the any rule. And if you're doing that, then the only way that um, you could get a false negative is if both the first test and the second test were a false negative, and that goes down, that probability. But on the other hand, if you are in a situation where the false positive is costly, so this could be a young individual who is not living near any elderly people and who is earning and is sending money home, etc. Uh, you don't really want to uh, declare them as a positive. So here you would say, well, only if doubly positive, I'll call it a positive. So that is called an AND rule. And it gives you very few false positives. But the problem is, look at the false negatives, much more false negatives. And similarly, with the any rule, fine, you get less false negatives, but way more false positives. So this is ending up to be, again, a trade-off over here. But now if you say, I'll go and do three cheap tests, because I'm thinking like this, uh, you can say that we have $100 or pounds for one RT-PCR. If you've done two cheap tests, that's only $20, $20. Three cheap tests will be $30. So let's see what you can do with three cheap tests. You can, in fact, break this trade-off. You'll actually have eight possible outcome sequences. Just like if you were tossing three coins, you could get plus, 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 minus, et cetera, et cetera, minus, minus, minus. But then how do you classify, right? So if you take the extreme kind of versions of believe um, like only minus, minus, minus is going to be a negative, or if you say any kind of plus is going to be a positive, you are not going to get better than the individual tests because those are very stark trade-offs. But then you could say, well, I'll do majority rule. And majority rule can sometimes work, 
But in fact, if you think of the number of ways you can classify eight outcome sequences, it's 256 possible classification rules. Because for every outcome sequence, you have to decide plus or minus two to the eight. That's a lot. And majority rule is one of those. Sometimes it's good, but suppose that out of those three tests, two of them are pretty bad tests and they are very correlated with each other in their outcomes. And the third test is a really good test and tends to not be correlated with those two. So then majority rule will not help you over there in that instance. So what we have done in follow on research, and this work is done with um, uh, Sanjay Jain and um, uh, Jonas, uh, Jonasson, who is a LBS PhD uh, now at MIT and uh, 13 co-authors from Imperial. And our Imperial co-authors are epidemiologists, immunologists, uh, virologists, uh, some surgeons, et cetera. We've developed a, basically a data-driven methodology that generates optimal classification rules. And by optimal, what I mean is that there will be no other classification rule which can improve both the sensitivity and the specificity that one is getting from using one of our rules. So there will be a trade-off. You might get better on one, but you'll get worse on the other. And with this type of method, basically you can take those same three tests and you can tailor to very different types of patient populations. If you're seeing a patient who is that um, type who has a very high cost of false negatives, you can choose one classification rule. If it's an intermediate cost of false negatives, you could choose another. If it's a low cost and a high cost of false positives, you could choose a different rule. All of that from three tests and 70% cost saving, because remember we started with a hundred pounds and we've still got 70 pounds in the pocket. And these tests are also much faster. It's usually 20 to 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get a result. And parallel testing is very possible here. And furthermore, these tests are much easier to do, even in developing countries. You don't require major labs, much easier to uh, develop these tests and to run the test and get the result. So basically we are arguing, save on those expensive PCRs, spend on clever use of rapid tests to increase health equity. I think it's really fascinating because it shows, you know, how very simple statistics and uh, some clever application can save money and at the same time be efficient. I'll come back to you, Kamali, discussing more generally about the uh, vaccinations and more generally about other health interventions. But I really want to go back to, to Shebnam. Uh, Shebnam, uh, you did a great job summarizing your paper, but you went really fast in the end. So uh, I will ask you if you can clarify exactly the various scenarios. And I'm particularly intrigued, uh, and I think an open question is about the sectoral implications that you mentioned before. So. Uh, which sectors in rich countries will be affected the most? And what about the other way around? Which sectors in emerging markets perhaps will be affected the most? Uh, and I think also, I don't know whether you have addressed this in your paper, there's also an ethical issue, I guess. And uh, let's say that you have a small economy, let's say in Africa, that has some manufacturing capacity. Do you really want to vaccinate those people because those will generate a positive spillover, let's say, of an American or a Chinese or a European firm or the elderly? So I think it, it's great that you stress how economics and ethics can go handy. Typically, we think of the other way around, but I would ask you if you can please to elaborate on those issues. Okay, so sure. Uh, and I, again, just I have to say it's, it's fascinating, Kamalini, what you guys uh, were doing. I never thought of, uh, you know, uh, kind of thinking about that way. So it is really, really amazing. Um, but just going back to uh, what we do and uh, what Elias asked. So let me first, okay, show you maybe with, with maps, right? Because that's going to make it uh, clear. So this is this is the map of the world, and uh, the, here the we, we plot uh, percent GDP losses. Uh, with the um, pandemic and also relative to a counterfactual of vaccinating everyone. So imagine you vaccinate everyone, so you go back to the world in 2019 versus vaccinations are uh, inequitable. 
So the color coding here is, you know, darker shades are going to be the highest, uh, highest uh, loss, so highest cost countries. Obviously, all emerging markets and developing countries. You know, you see here uh, South America, Africa. So they are going to be in that group. Um, now, the the point here is again, we always want to know the cost on the advanced economies. That's why you see that we do it country by country, but we don't even put the cost down here on the orange and red because they are going to have the highest cost, right? Turkey is here. But for example, if you focus on uh, US here, right? So in terms of say US vaccinate everyone, rest of the world is not vaccinated. And in this case, rest of the world is still sick and US of course uh, sells to the rest of the world, right? right? Rest of the world is in recession and US exports are going to go down. So if you only think in terms of like export, lost export earning, then the cost is, you know, 135 billion. Okay, you see, so, so you know, it is something, but you know, not maybe that high, you might think. And then, you know, here, sell the 5 billion, you know, Europe is going to be some of these, these numbers here. But I would like to show you the second map. You see now everything gets darker. Everything is now almost orange. Uh, and of course, still, you know, Africa, Latin America, emerging markets and developing economies are like with the highest cost. But now the advanced economies get darker colors. Their cost has increased because the second map has this full amplification through global trade and production network. So if this incorporates when US cannot buy the chip from Taiwan, then the car manufacturing in US is going to slow down. And now the US cost you see from 135 billion goes up to 607 to 1 billion, okay? So that adds up, you know, we add up these on all advanced economies and that's how we come to, you know, they are almost paying 2 trillion of the 4 trillion cost in this case. Now, this is very important exactly because of that sectoral dimension. Why, you know, I go from this lighter color to darker colors when I allow full amplification through a trade network is exactly that sectoral heterogeneity alias you are asking. Let me try to illustrate this with these two figures. So here, I'm now plotting this cost at the sector level. On the maps, I did it at the country level and the numbers I always showed you before was at the country level. Now, this is at the sector level. And I'm going to separate the vaccinated advanced economy sectors. These are one digit sectors on the left and unvaccinated emerging market and developed economy sectors on the right. I plot the same sectors uh, on the Y axis. X axis in both figures are going to be GDP loss relative to a case where everybody's vaccinated and you go back to pre-pandemic GDP, okay? So the first thing and the color coding is tradable sectors are blue, non-tradable sectors are in pink. The first thing I want to uh, show you, first of all, huge heterogeneity. So here I'm plotting these box plots where, you know, every bar with the lines show you all the countries, you know, so these dots are going to be extreme outlier countries here, but every, you know, uh, uh, observation is a country. So it shows you the, the country heterogeneity. But more importantly, when you look at unvaccinated emerging markets and the economies, uh, Elias, exactly as you were uh, referring to, we see a typical ranking of the sectors, right? What do I mean with that? The highest loss sector, even with the country heterogeneity, is going to be in the bottom, accommodation and food services, right? So there are going to be countries in accommodation and food services that are losing 60% of the output in those services sectors versus something very low, given with this uh, vertical uh, black line here, that's going to be the maximum loss in an advanced economies in this sector, right? Why is that? Because that, those economies are now vaccinated. But basically in this figure on the right, you see a sectoral ranking from like highest loss in accommodation and food, arts and entertainment, you know, so basically the services sector are still going to have the highest loss with the country heterogeneity in unvaccinated countries. Now you go to the vaccinated advanced economies, you know, you mimic this minimum loss given here with this vertical black line in accommodation and food services, right? When you go to the advanced economies, now they are vaccinated. That means their economies are open. So the restaurants are open, gyms are open. And if you look at the accommodation and food, arts and entertainment, this hard hit sector, when domestic pandemic is going on, this loss is very similar. It's very small here, right? We look at country heterogeneity. So, and then we highlight two countries, US, in uh, purple blue diamond and Netherlands in orange triangle. So these vaccinated country losses are going to be positively correlated with openness and Netherlands is a more open country than US. So the triangle is going to be ahead of uh, the diamonds so and Netherlands are going to have higher losses in those sectors. But overall, those type of service sector losses are now smaller in vaccinated advanced economies. Look at the sectors with largest losses now in these vaccinated advanced economies that's going to be agriculture and fishing, the bottom sector, wholesale and retail. 
transport and storage. And transport and storage and wholesale and retail, they are actually pink, right? They are non-tradable sectors, but they are linked to other tradable sectors and they buy a lot of inputs internationally. That is a story of car manufacturers in the US and also the whole, you know, now the, the transportation and retail sector in the US is also having a very hard time, right? And this is US here. So US losses in these sectors can go as high as 15% of the output of those sectors. And that's what is going to give you the losses in US, which is a country that is going to be full of vaccination by, uh, by uh, mid 2021. So this again shows the importance of how, you know, through your global linkages in certain sectors that are really linked to the global economy in terms of demand and production as a country like US shown in purple diamond here, you can lose a lot because you are large and you are an important partner in that global trade and production network. So even you vaccinate all your countries. So this is how we make the economic case in the paper that no economy is an island, your sectors are connected to other sectors in other countries. And until every economy recovers, no economy recovers, basically through this means. Thank you, Shannon. Actually, uh, let me ask a, a geeky question before I move to Kamalini. So do you allow also for stealing of some, so I was thinking of tourism, for example. Mm -hmm. So think about the Mediterranean. One could argue that, you know, if the Northern part of the Mediterranean is vaccinated, perhaps they steal uh, tourists from the south, which happened to be in Africa or in the Middle East. Do you allow for these things or not? Yes, no, this is exactly, I mean, so we allow it through the demand side. So like if, you know, say Greece vaccinates everyone and Turkey not, okay? So then the demand for tourism is going to be higher in Greece. So tourists will go to Greece and not to Turkey. So that's going to be incorporated through this demand channel in that sector that demand is just not going to normalize in Turkey as long as Turkey vaccinates everyone, right? I mean, or there's widespread vaccination as opposed to Greece, let's say, finishes widespread vaccination before Turkey. This is definitely going to be allowed through the demand side, yeah. Thank you. So, Kamalini, I wanted to ask you more generally about uh, health care provision. Uh, I know that you have been working for something like seven years uh, with the uh, Aravind Eye Hospital in India, like one of the biggest hospitals I think in the world. And uh, you have been pushing a lot for group appointments. Uh, so I would like, you know, your insights, uh, how, how can we think more generally in emerging markets and uh, lower middle income and frontier economies about these issues? And, but before I do that, I, I, I got an interesting question from Anjori Parisha, which I want to keep the time shortly for the question, but it strongly relates to your point about, about testing. So the question that uh, uh, Anjori is asking is, okay, you describe a case where we have one PCR test with $100 cost and three uh, quick tests, rapid tests with $10 cost each. But how about this technique of using pool sampling? with the more accurate PCR test. So can you please take both questions? Something perhaps with a second. Definitely, the pool sampling is a very excellent idea. And there are countries like Germany has been doing a lot of pool sampling. And uh, in fact, uh, with uh, colleagues at London Business School, uh, Ali Awad and a PhD student, uh, Tong Wang, we are starting to look at some models uh, looking at pool sampling. So the um, the idea in pooled sampling essentially is that in the first stage, you pool together a bunch of patients. And uh, if the test comes out negative, then all of them go scot-free. If the test comes out positive, then you have to decide on a second stage to either divide in half and do pools or go to individual testing. There's certainly uh, benefit over there from pool sampling. And I think it is, again, an approach that is not being used enough. We, I think that these are the types of approaches, repeat testing, pool testing. We definitely need to do more on those because you can get as good accuracy at much less cost. So I see that you're viewing more as a complement to your idea of multiple yes. rapid yeah. tests rather than a substitute. Yeah. And, you know, all of these approaches have some, uh, there could be some places one thing is easier to do than another. So I, I think that we need to use every such approach that we can. I wouldn't I call them substitutes. And going to the second uh, question that you asked about, I also want to uh, reflect on that map which uh, Shebnam showed, which is again, 
you know, the one with all the dark colors on it with Africa and the other developing countries being even darker, but the whole world becoming dark. And that is about vaccination. And if we can't get vaccinations fast enough to those parts of the world, we do also have some other things that we can do, which is uh, educating people on uh, how to uh, not uh, get quickly infected, for instance, and also dealing with all of the other types of care issues which have become ignored because all doctors have paid attention to COVID. And uh, you mentioned the Arvind Eye Hospital. This is, in fact, the biggest eye hospital in the world. And they are doing two thirds of the eye volume of the NHS at one hundredth of the cost. They are a hospital that cares deeply about health equity. Their goal is to eliminate needless blindness. The reason I got to know Arvind is because I had uh, learned about a model called group appointments, shared appointments in the US, in fact. The Cleveland Clinic has been doing these for 20 years. And the idea is that if you have um, multiple people who have uh, a particular disease, rather than see them one on one, if you see five or six of them at once, you can. Uh, give each one a one-on-one -on -one appointment in front of other patients. So you don't get the private appointment, but you do get the full one-on-one -on -one attention, diagnosis and prescription. And uh, it can obviously save cost for the doctor because they don't repeat stuff. But the patients, some patients are shy. They get to hear somebody else ask questions which are relevant to them. They get much more information, et cetera. Arvind, uh, in fact, uh, worked with us, with uh, Nazdeh Sonmez, who is a PhD student at LBS, and Ryan Buell at Harvard, and two doctors at Arvind. We ran a huge trial of shared appointments for glaucoma, 1,000 patients, and found that they are very effective. They improve compliance to medication. They improve engagement, satisfaction, knowledge, et cetera. Arvind happens to have been a WHO collaborating center for 30 years. And uh, when the pandemic came, uh, I want to share my uh, slides now. When the pandemic came, uh, interestingly, telemedicine, and you said, uh, Shebnam, that you know, teleworking is not very possible in healthcare because there's a lot that you can't do remotely. Nonetheless, telemedicine has absolutely rocketed 500% or more increase in different parts of the world in telemedicine and smart telehealth can help to bridge the health divide. Because uh, this is an example from India and this is work I did with Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, chief scientist at the WHO. This particular example is the Indian government. There are large number of villagers in India who do not have a smartphone. What they have done is they have built these uh, village centers where you have a healthcare worker, this person with the plus on their cap, they have a smartphone. So a villager can go to meet a healthcare worker who has a smartphone and through that phone, they can talk to a generalist. And then if needed, they can also talk to a specialist. This has been done in about 30,000 villages and there's a plan to massively, massively escalate this. And this is bringing equity because these people otherwise had no access to care. And interestingly, COVID has allowed telemedicine, which has been around for 15 or 20 years, to massively escalate because now there's no other opportunity. People are doing it. Here's where our thinking um, was that while this is great, there's a huge shortage today of telemedicine capacity, great shortage. Therefore, if you decided to do virtual shared appointments, that would massively multiply telehealth capacity. So think about those same villagers in the villages. And naturally, they cannot come near any other villager during COVID. However, um, they could connect into a shared appointment with that generalist. And so now you have a villager in four or five different villages, they are all seeing each other on their healthcare workers screen and they're also seeing the generalist doctor and they are getting their problems sorted out. 
this is going to allow shorter waits. When you do shared appointments, the Cleveland Clinic uh, has massively reduced waits uh, and 300% improvement in productivity they've been seeing for years. They actually offer shared appointments in every specialty, but most other hospitals don't want to try it out because they say, what are you talking about? I see patients one-on-one. -on -one. Whereas in a crisis, people are willing to try things and this shared appointments virtually is also taking off now in the Cleveland Clinic and some other institutions are starting to show interest in it. And in fact, hopefully even past the pandemic, this idea can work. Past the pandemic, you can get groups of patients in the same village coming together. Now, when you do that, all kinds of auxiliary pro uh, providers from local towns may see that, oh, now there's enough business opportunity here that um, a pharmacist or a nutritionist um, or a physiotherapist, they might show up around that time of the shared appointments and the patients would be better off. Um, there's business and um, there is much better use of that telemedicine capacity. So this is um, an idea which even within the developing world, you know, we've talked earlier and Shabnam, you've shown very clearly that um, gap between the developing and the developed world. But in fact, with healthcare, there are huge gaps even within the developing world. This can certainly, this kind of approach can help to uh, reduce that inequity. Thank you, Kamalini. So uh, actually, as you rightly point out, uh, that there is considerable inequities uh, within emerging markets and low-income countries. Actually, there's a lot of research in economics showing that the lowest the level of development overall, the highest the regional inequities. For example, clearly this is the case coming from our own research in Africa. Uh, so I think perhaps in an extension, Shevlem and her team or others could look more and zoom on heterogeneity within those very big emerging markets, like for example, Nigeria, Brazil, uh, so Raihan uh, uh, is saying that uh, what's your, I guess it's a question for you, Kamarini, is that you know he likes this idea of group appointments, what will it stay after the pandemic ends? So the question is, uh, you know, will this be something short term or more long term? It's a very good question. One thing about shared appointments, which is known because they have been around for 20 years, even though most people haven't heard of them, is that when people experience a shared appointment, they are very likely to want to come for another one. Now, obviously there's been selection also because certain people chose into it. But uh, our hope is that uh, with the pandemic, some of these shackles are being broken. You know, telemedicine has been around forever. E-learning and uh, e-teaching has been around forever, but none of us were doing it and now we're all doing it. So hopefully, I'm not sure what, what is the response of, of the students here. So you know, <laughs> I'm hesitant to extrapolate you know, <laughs> the experience coming from academia here. Now, Iceland, I think, is raising a point that actually is, is effectively Iceland what connected and put us together, Sherman and Kamalini, that, you know, how we can think perhaps more creatively and combine vaccinations with testing. Iceland is raising the issue of mutation, so perhaps the vaccines are not so successful uh, uh, coping with the various uh, mutations, although I think so far they are. So perhaps we should think more generally, you know, how we can combine uh, those two instruments and perhaps uh, more instruments, uh, like some form of treatment. Shevna, I don't know whether you have any views or, or thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And I just want to clarify. So the, the way our numbers uh, work is, you know, you, you, you control the pandemic in your country with vaccination. Of course, it can be done with other means. In fact, we have China as part of also the vaccinated group, although we know that, you know, China is nowhere uh, close by being all the citizens are, are vaccinated, right? So the, the, the idea is like, you know, what you do, vaccines plus others, or just other type of interventions that somehow that is effective in stopping the pandemic in terms of normalizing the demand and eliminating the, the, the labor supply shock, right? So as long as you are successful in that, all the numbers and the maps is still going to work, right? So, so uh, that, that darker color, you know, so uh, the reason why emerging market and developing economies like the darkest is because they have pandemic raging, right? We start with infection 
uh, numbers end of 2020 and we project the disease. So, so if you somehow cannot control the disease in your country, you're always going to be the darkest color. The interesting thing is like, you know, the advanced economy is getting darker also, even they control the pandemic because of other people in you know, other countries being sick, right? But if you use other means than the vaccines, by all means, please definitely do it and then control the pandemic in your country. That is definitely good for you, but it is good for others too. So that's, that's the, you know, you know, the point, point of the paper. And going back to uh, one of the issues that Elias raised, right? Okay, how do we then maybe combine the ethical and the economic thing? We can actually, if you look at the COVAX initiative right now, started distributing for a vaccines for a global equitable distribution. They started with Ghana and Kenya. And I believe they started with kind of the, the, you know, the poorest country who has nothing type of approach, right? But we can definitely try to combine this. Let me also make sure I give it to countries that are like very central in this global network and going to affect a lot of uh, producers. For example, Taiwan. In fact, Taiwan actually recently appealed to Germany because many sectors in Germany now have to stop production because they cannot get things from Taiwan asking for vaccines, right? So we can definitely bring this dimension in too. So try to combine the economics with the ethical because ethical is of course always going to go with, let me just give to the country first who has like nothing, no vaccines whatsoever, which we should do. But I think both together is going to help, uh, you know, reducing the inequality and bringing out the maximum economic gain, right? If you also would like to, uh, bring the economic side of the story. I agree with that. I think definitely both, uh, all approaches need to be used hand in hand, vaccination, testing, care delivery. And with the uh, testing, uh, the uh, so because vaccination rollout cannot happen instantly, it's going to take time. The testing definitely needs to go in parallel, the, the infection testing there could potentially even be room for the antibody testing because again, there the science is still not fully clear on how long the, uh, you know, once you have antibodies, how long the protection lasts. But as that science developed, I could imagine that the antibody testing could be useful also in prioritizing that if you have good strong antibodies, perhaps you could wait a little longer to get the vaccine. Actually, we have five more minutes, so I, I, I want to have the privilege of asking two unexpected questions to, to both of you uh, uh, in the following sense. So you have been doing very fascinating research uh, for many years, uh, publishing in top journals, having an impact in their respective fields. And nowadays with your research, you are expanding, you are talking with policymakers, you are liaising with international organizations. So uh, what, is, uh, what is your feeling? For example, uh, Shemna, let me start with you. Clearly, during the past year, there was not much interest, uh, I would say, both from the EU and the US administration or vaccinating uh, low income and frontier economies. And nowadays, I think it's going to be part of the next G7 uh, agenda. Uh, a lot to referring to your work. How does it feel? And you know, how hard it is to break in the top uh, policy circles? No, this is, this is the best thing about this research, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I feel like I'm going to lose my mind in pandemic. I, I'm an extrovert. So being locked down is like not good for people like me. So I'm like, okay, I have to work. And then I realized, you know, this type of work can have an impact and then it did. So I am super happy about that. We are all very happy about that. Now, I think you are right. I mean, not just our work. We need many, many, you know, papers like that and also international institutions, right? Like institutions like uh, IMF, World Bank, OECD, they, they run in the forefront of this, right? So they are global institutions, they are multilateral institutions. So the message we are giving with our work is like, look, globalization might have amplified the pandemic. Of course, we are talking about a virus that spreads through, through traveling, right? But globalization is also the only solution, only solution to the pandemic. This is, this is the thing that we want to underline. And now I think, uh, you know, the institutions are also pushing it. You know, there's our work, more people are working on this. And, and as you, our point in Elias, the US administration and EU, they're also coming around and they're understanding the importance in this. We are all in this together and we are in this globalized world. I mean, I also see all this rhetoric now and narrative, let's push back in the globalization and all that. I hope we don't go down that way. I mean, this is not something, we have been living in a global world in the last 30 years. It's not something you can just revert overnight. So we may, it's better we make the best use of it and we use it to our advantage to solve the pandemic. Kamalini, what is also your view? Actually, I'm trying to teach my nine-year-old son 
and my seven-year-old daughter like tossing coins. But <laughs> going from that and you know blending them, I guess with a bit more math on the operation side, you know how do you convey this? Uh, uh, you have been working a lot with the World Health Organization specialists there. So what's your experience with that? I think that it's true that being locked down has been very difficult during the pandemic. The thing that has fascinated me is how people from very different disciplines have been coming together to work on problems and sharing data, sharing ideas, et cetera. And also, um, so, you know, for instance, and I, I, I uh, am doing some other work locally where uh, we want to do some uh, testing and virtual shared appointments. And there is a doctor in the University of uh, UCSF, University uh, of San Francisco. Uh, she's an AIDS specialist, Dr. Diane Havler, very famous AIDS specialist. She has switched all her attention to COVID te testing and doing mass testing for COVID in the poorer neighborhoods of San Francisco. I basically called her out of the blue and she was very happy to talk to me and share all of the kinds of things she was doing. And this is very touching that people can share and find the time. Uh, you know, she spoke to me at, I think, 5.30 a.m. her time uh, on, a, on a busy day. It's also, uh, I think, um, something to uh, feel happy about that people are uh, reacting in different parts of the world to where they are seeing good ideas from different sources because everyone is scanning very broadly to see. And there are some institutions and people and organizations who would be more willing to try something out. And now they are doing it at an even larger scale, scanning internationally across disciplines to find solutions. I, I hope that that continues past the pandemic, not just for healthcare, but for other problems, because there's a lot of power in joint thinking to solve major problems. Thank you, uh, Kamalina. I don't want to add anything. I fully subscribe to you and your and Shepard's remarks. So with this uh, positive note, uh, let me thank you again for taking the time and being with us. Uh, it was a pleasure at the London Business School at the William Institute for Business and Development to host you. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in one of our future uh, events. So thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you, Shevna, and thank you, Kamalina. Thank you.